Uh, welcome, everybody. We're still letting people in, but I'm going to give a short introduction. So um, I just want to say welcome to How Music Moves Us, exploring the connection between music and emotions. Uh, my name is Pamela Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Society and the chairperson of the um, Society and Neuroscience Program. Uh, this virtual seminar was organized by the Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience as part of the seminars um, series. We have many new attendees. We have hundreds of attendees from all over the world today. So I want to provide a short overview of the Presidential Scholars Program, which is managed by the Center for Science and Society. The Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience Program facilitates cross-disciplinary collaborative research to advance our understanding of mind, brain, and behavior. Bringing together talented early career scholars from a variety of fields with faculty experts in neuroscience and in the humanities, arts, and social sciences, the program has developed a new paradigm for original integrative research and training. The program supports early postdoctoral scholars, seed funding for cross-disciplinary research, and a variety of seminars, conferences, and other events. The Presidential Scholars Program is housed in the Center for Science and Society, a hub for researchers, scholars, and practitioners seeking to break down traditional disciplinary silos and enhance public understanding of science. The core of the program is formed by our early career presidential scholars postdoctoral scholars pursuing independent research about mind, brain, and behavior at the intersection of the humanities, natural, and social sciences. Each scholar receives tailored support for their project from at least two faculty members from different departments. And you can see that some of them have many more than two. Um, these uh, faculty mentors have relevant knowledge and expertise to help guide their research. Current mentors come from neuroscience, sociology, psychology, and psychiatry, narrative medicine, music, philosophy, and many other disciplines. I am thrilled now to introduce the two new presidential scholars who joined the program this year in July. Valerio Amaretti is a literary scholar who studies how reading and writing affect our mind and brain in order to better understand the role that literature and narrative play in enabling long-term psychic change and creativity. Raphael Millier is a philosopher interested in the philosophy of mind and of cognitive science with a focus on using empirical neuroscience research to examine self-consciousness and self-representation. We look forward very much to seeing how their projects develop over the next three years. The scholars and PSSN faculty are central in organizing interdisciplinary events. Now, due to the pandemic, of course, our entire fall programming is virtual, but I do hope that you can join us at our upcoming virtual seminars on December 1st for a conversation about what artificial intelligence can teach us about the brain, and on December 8th for a panel on the importance of the first 1,000 days of life. I hope you will visit our website here, as you can see, many arrows pointing to it, um, to register for both events and to sign up for our monthly newsletter. Many of you are familiar by now with Zoom. Um, we encourage you to participate by submitting your questions at any time using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will share these questions during the Q&A period towards the end of the event. You will be able to see the questions posted by other attendees, and you can also upvote questions that you think are most important. The PSSN program would not be possible without the support of the leadership at Columbia, including President Lee Bollinger and our valued steering committee members, Peter Berman, Michael Goldberg, Carol Mason, Valerie Purdy Greenaway, and Christopher Peacock. Faculty from across the university participate on the advisory council mentor our scholars and volunteer for review and inter, uh, for to review and interview our applicants. Thank you all to all of you who have helped make this program an example of interdisciplinary achievement. We welcome new ideas for programming, research and teaching. And we will be providing ways to keep in touch in the chat box throughout the event. If you enjoy today's free event, we also appreciate small donations, which will be used to help keep us streaming our 
public events once we return to in-person seminars, hopefully in the coming months. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Matthew Sachs. Dr. Sachs is a presidential scholar who investigates the neural and behavioral mechanisms involved in emotions and feeling in response to music. He received his PhD from the University of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute, and his projects involve applying data-driven multivariate models to capture the patterns of neural activity that accompany uniquely human experiences with, with music such as feelings of chills, pleasurable sadness, and nostalgic. I'm going to turn it over now to Matt. Thank you, Pamela, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for making the time to be here and all three speakers. I'm very grateful to see such a large group here and so much interest. I also want to thank Joseph, Melinda, and my advisors, uh, and all the members of the Center for Science and Society for helping me put on this event. The origins of this uh, event came from the undeniable ability of music to make us feel especially given uh, recent events. We've, we've all probably likely seen videos of people performing music on their rooftops during the COVID-19 lockdown. If you happen to be out in the streets in any major city last Saturday, surely you noticed the relentless outpouring of music that scored the festivities. And as a neuroscientist who uses the ability of music to study the mechanisms of the brain, I often find myself straddling these two separate worlds, worlds that often use different language, different units of thought, and different modalities to tackle a similar concept, which is why and how is music able to move us so profoundly? So in order to address this question more holistically and facilitate cross-disciplinary discussions, I invited three experts from the field to share their perspectives on the relationship between music, emotions, and feelings. Each speaker will present for roughly 15 minutes, back to back to back. And during the talks, as Pamela mentioned, you can participate by submitting questions using the Q&A button. Audience members will be able to see the questions submitted by other attendees and upvote the ones they'd like the speakers to answer. And after all three presentations, we'll have a 30 minute panel discussion uh, in which the speakers will have the opportunity to engage with each other and I can ask them questions directly from the audience. So the first speaker is Dr. Elvira Bradico, who's currently a professor of neuroscience at the Center for Music in the Brain at Aarhus University in Denmark. And Dr. Bradico is one of the leading experts in the neuroscience of music and aesthetics, and her work has been published and cited in dozens of high-impact cross-disciplinary journals. And across her work, Dr. Bradico has developed and tested theory-driven models for the neurobiological changes that underpin aesthetic experiences with music. So I just want to welcome Dr. Bradico. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. And thanks a lot for inv inviting me here. This is really a big honor for me. And I'm going to jump quickly to my slides, so I will proceed. And I just want to tell you that music has always existed. It has accompanied us as humans since the beginning, really, of our species, since the, the start of Homo sapiens uh, as a species, and perhaps even earlier, actually, because uh, in uh, 1996, uh, a flute made up of a, a leg bone of a bear was found in a cave, which was a Neanderthal cave in the north of Slovenia. So this means that actually uh, music might have been discovered somehow and musical instrument may, might have been used even by Neanderthal uh, species. And music might be as old as 40,000 years or, or even older. In fact, we know from research that the human voice has gained its full vocal range more than 500,000 years ago. So we have uh, um, fossil evidence for telling us that music is as old at least as cave paintings or even uh, perhaps older. And of course it has accompanied uh, all the civilizations and uh, reached us. Uh, so music listening and musical activities are uh, an everyday phenomenon in humans all around the planet. And why music? Why this is so uh, universal phenomenon? Because it has many ad functions that are adaptive for humans, meaning that they have helped humans to uh, survive so that they uh, accompany the evolution of species. The first uh, adaptive function might be called emotional because music helps to regulate physiological state and homeostasis. And I'll talk about this uh, more later. 
uh, music also has perceptual cognitive function for humans because it exercises our cognition and our perception. It might even be considered a fitness indicator because complex music might be something that only healthy, um, like healthy people can do, uh, or this could have actually uh, provided cues for uh, the fitness uh, for the human uh, species. And also another function is the self. So because music is useful for self-reflection and awareness uh, of own identity and uh, for social function. So affiliation, parental care and communication are important, uh, um, important aspects of uh, music uh, activities. And I'll talk about this more later as well. But uh, in a literature, uh, Stefan Kirsch, who is a very uh, famous uh, scholar in music neuroscience field, has identified what uh, can be called the seven C's. Uh, so one C is for contact, social contact. And as Matt mentioned, we have seen the uh, importance of social contact through music during the lockdown when all the other contacts, physical contacts were not possible. And then, uh, Cognition, so the cognition, as I mentioned before, is very important, and also social cognition, communication with uh, people. Uh, Copathy, so feeling together, coordination of actions, cooperation leading to group cohesion. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, uh, music might have begun its long historical evolution uh, using the words by Habibi and Antonio Damasio, because by its effects in physiological states, it played a role in homeostasis. So uh, there are really many reasons why we have music with us and we have kept it for the whole history of the human uh, race. But uh, when we focus rather than on uh, music functions overall on uh, really the emotional reactions uh, to music, the, what I would like to call affected reactions, uh, affective responses to mean a broader uh, concept so that encompasses emotions, but not only emotions. Uh, we could actually um, um, talk about, as I said, emotions, uh, because we have from music um, emotional responses, meaning measurable brief responses to internal or external events, and that are characterized by uh, three components that are typical of emotions bodily cues such as facial expression, uh, subjective feelings, so the um, uh, knowledge that we are having uh, emotions, and motor tendencies, so the um, drive to do something, to uh, feel, to uh, withdraw or approach some stimulus, stimulus. So we have all of this for music, so we can say that we have music emotions. And uh, these music emotions have been studied in the literature for the past uh, uh, decades, and especially by um, referring to two main uh, uh, theories of emotions in general. Uh, on one side, the basic emotion theory, which was first de developed in the uh, 70s by Paul Ekman, and uh, it refers to the universal uh, um, uh, expression of certain kinds of emotions such as sadness, happiness, surprise, anger, fear. Um, but also we have in, uh, uh, in the literature another important uh, model of emotions which is the C complex or dimensional model which actually um, like organizes or represents emotions over two uh, dimensions on the Cartesian uh, uh, axis. On one dimension, there is valence. So from a positive to negative valence, meaning uh, pleasantness or unpleasantness, for example. And on in a, the other dimension, arousal, meaning uh, uh, relaxing or arousing um, um, like a dimension of emotion. And so uh, music can be mapped uh, onto these two dimensions, as well as it can also represent different kinds of basic emotions. So as I said, these are the predominant models that have been used in the literature, but they are not the only ones. There are also some less uh, predominant models such as music specific models. 
And the first uh, uh, neuroimaging study which was done um, to study the neural correlates of music emotions was done by Mitter Schiff, Haller and colleagues in the 2007. So as you can see there, there is already a couple of decades of research in this field. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, music affect uh, encompasses also other kinds of emotions or other kinds of affect, I should say. And I would like to point the attention to um, enjoyment or conscious pleasure or liking, which is a kind of uh, aesthetic emotion. And it also involves uh, evaluative, um, uh, some evaluative decisions about liking or not liking, uh, uh, like a piece of music, for example. And this kind of uh, uh, broader, uh, broader concept of uh, affect in uh, relation to music has been introduced uh, from the field uh, or of empirical aesthetics and also neuroaesthetics, and including uh, in my work uh, and research. And uh, as well, uh, we have aesthetic judgments, which can also be considered special kinds of affective responses to music, because they relate again to an evaluative uh, judgment and decision about specific uh, formal aspects of a uh, musical piece, for example, in particularly beauty is the most uh, studied one, but it's not the only criteria for deciding whether something is um, positively uh, evaluative, positively appraised or, or negatively appraised. And uh, then another important affective response to music or, or another important uh, emotional function of music, we can say is the mood regulation. And I mentioned it already before in relation to adaptive functions of music. And this is uh, really uh, crucial because music has this uh, um, capacity to uh, mo uh, change our um, the, uh, the affect state of low intensity as we can uh, define mood. Uh, and uh, uh, in the field of uh, music psychology, um, Suvi Sari Kallio has identified seven different strategies that can be used mm -hmm. to regulate uh, um, mood by music. And finally, uh, we can also uh, talk about the general uh, concept of uh, social emotions. So the social relatedness, which is seen actually as one of the main reasons for listening to music uh, from a, a large survey, which has been done recently by Chef and other in 2013. And together with the uh, relatedness, also self-awareness uh, is uh, another important reason and, and uh, mood regulation and arousal. And uh, social emotions are really uh, crucial. And uh, we have seen uh, many instances, again, in the lockdown period and still now, and they relate to the, um, uh, to the important function of a bonding and the cohesion between uh, uh, members of a community. And there might be also something about uh, attraction. So the reason why many people go to the um, to dance or to uh, a concert might be also related to to find the right mate, so to speak. And we can think about interesting uh, phenomena of uh, uh, deaf uh, deaf rave. Uh, so the people who are actually uh, with no uh, hearing they are still wanting to go to disco and to, to dance together and they actually of course don't hear all the frequencies of sounds but they can uh, hear feel the vibrations and the beat and this is a very nice example of what why uh, music is so important also for this kind of uh, social uh, uh, relatedness type of emotions and uh, uh, i should actually move quickly but uh, uh, i want to just to mention the uh, intense pleasure that we have uh, for music that can be related to a uh, quick reaction to, to a sound crucifixes in the music or also to more conscious uh, um, experience of the music. And uh, intense pressure can trigger uh, measurable responses in the body, um, namely chills or frissons, so the uh, goosebumps or uh, shivers on the spines. Uh, and it can be measured with uh, polygraphy uh, with um, all this uh, uh, devices that you see here in the screen, and they can be seen in uh, the ones or some specific parts of the brain uh, when using uh, neuroimaging, um, uh, neuroimaging methods such as uh, 
uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging or positive transmission tomography. And uh, we see this activity in the ventral part of the striatum, the nucleus accumbent, accumbens, uh, here um, shortened as NAC, or in the dorsal part of the striatum, which is uh, the head of the caudate here, shortened as CAU, CAU. And these uh, structures uh, deep down in the brain are uh, so-called hedonic hotspots uh, because they are actually very important for uh, encoding, um, wanting for a very pleasurable uh, stimulus or very pleasurable by experience such as uh, glucose, uh, like sugar, very nice food or sex or um, and then we also have them activated and firing uh, in so there is neuronal activity, which is uh, dominated by dopaminergic um, neurotransmission, uh, also for music, which is, of course, uh, non, uh, it's a very mo more abstract stimulus as compared to the food or sex that I mentioned before. And uh, uh, as I mentioned also that we can distinguish conscious liking enjoyment to, uh, uh, as opposed to discrete and, uh, and basic emotions. And uh, I've done a study uh, just to demonstrate this. And indeed, when we look at um, liking versus disliking, or yeah, like versus dislike music, we have uh, lots of activities uh, deep down in the brain, including in these areas that are related to the hedonic hotspots. Whereas when we actually uh, look at activity, which is related to um, recognizing and perceiving the sadness or the happiness in music, then we see uh, brain structures, which are mainly related to the processing of sounds and also some uh, limbic, uh, also some emotion related structures, but not at all these other areas that I pointed at earlier. And we use, I just want to give one example of the simulator that we used. Uh, this was a study done in Finland in my previous lab. Um, and they had, um, uh, the participants were able to bring their music to the lab. So this was just one uh, um, sad uh, song uh, which was disliked by the participant. And we had also happy songs uh, di disliked or happy songs likes and sad songs liked and disliked. And we also found uh, uh, that all these areas from this hot hedonic hotspots, also called reward uh, circuit, were uh, connected very much during this uh, uh, liked uh, experience of music. <clears throat> And uh, recently uh, we um, have, or we can read uh, from the literature, um, a new meta-analysis of fMRI findings, so neuroimaging findings of on music effect uh, conducted by uh, Stefan Kirsch that I mentioned also earlier. And this is a, a meta-analysis uh, that uh, follows up on a previous one by, done by him again uh, a few years back. And in this analysis, uh, we, we can see what are the brain regions activated by all kinds of emotions. So uh, all of them, uh, sad, uh, sadness, happiness, uh, uh, enjoyment, uh, dislike, all of them together. And then we can see that there are several regions that are belonging to um, yeah, limbic system. So emotion related regions, also this meso limbic, uh, uh, circuit, which uh, I mentioned earlier, which is the hedonic hotspot, uh, or, or which is collection of hedonic hotspots, uh, dominated or governed by dopaminergic neurotransmission. And then also, uh, of course, auditory cortex and some uh, motor areas. And uh, in general, what we know about the brain pathways uh, for music that allow us to uh, feel emotions from music and also 
have action tendencies and uh, end up even uh, dancing or, or crying to songs, for example. So we know, uh, as I mentioned, that there are these dopaminergic pathways, mesolimbic pathways related to wanting, to pleasurable activities. We also have limbic uh, paralimbic systems. And then we all have um, really like a circuit that starts from the thalamus and from the brainstem first and the thalamus and actually goes to the auditory cortex and all to the, this limbic uh, and mesolimbic areas uh, um, and uh, reaches out to the hypothalamus. And then this controls the autonomic nervous system activity. And the, then from there, the cardiovascular and respiratory systems and also the motor function and possibly um, from the, uh, yeah, I didn't mention, but there is also uh, the frontal lobe very much involved in making sense of sounds and then um, enjoying or not enjoying the sounds as well. So this is just a very quick overview. I can't go too much into details, but we know that affective responses to music impact on behavior. We know very well because of course we know that, uh, as I mentioned, the music can uplift and change mood, relax or activate. It can interest, uh, uh, it can bond uh, people with each other. But we also know a lot about the physiology, how it impacts on physiology because um, it affects stress biomarkers, uh, cortisol, uh, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, and uh, it regulates homeostasis, as I mentioned uh, several times already, and it boosts neuroplastic processes, actually, so it even can help neuro, uh, neuronal preservation in aging and in, even in dementia. And very importantly, in this period of the, of, of the history, it um, not only activates the dopaminergic and opioid system, but also in, in mono, immunological system, uh, so that we have higher IgA, and you have probably heard a bit too much about these uh, uh, markers, biomarkers of the immune system in this time. So, and actually we would really need to study more about the impact of music on the immune system. We, there are not enough studies about this, but we know that it, will, it has an impact. Uh, and this, all this manifests also um, kind of a, go uh, back to the well-being of healthy people but also uh, allow us to use music for treatment of several diseases and how uh, we can uh, have all this impact on, on effect uh, from uh, music so there are specific acoustic features which are actually constantly um, inducing certain emotions and they have been uh, studied very much in music psychology and also music neuroscience and uh, I've here sort of made a, a map. Uh, I don't have time to go into details here, but you can um, uh, have fun also look at some of the literature uh, about this. But uh, just to give an example, prototypical uh, happy music that is actually uh, very much uh, also used in, in uh, experiments. So it, it has fast tempo, major mode, bright timbre, high variable pitches, uh, staccato articulation and so on. And the opposite is sad music. Um, and uh, yeah, and all these tricks for uh, how to manipulate uh, features were used by uh, composers and from the, maybe from prehistory, we don't know about that much, but we know about uh, the history of music. Uh, such as um, here a son of uh, one of the sons of Bach saying that musician transmits his feelings to the audience that moves them effectively to experience cause sensations so, so the composers were really aware of what they were doing with the music but what are the mechanisms <laughs> uh, I'm reaching the the core of the talk what are really the mechanisms that determine the affective responses to music first one that uh, is shared by many scholars is called the brainstem reflexes, uh, which um, is really, uh, yeah, there is a consensus in the field that there is such, such a mechanism. And it's related to uh, the fact that certain features uh, immediately trigger uh, certain kinds of sensations and uh, uh, emotional responses, which can be uh, named um, core pleasure, because for example, or core displeasure. Uh, for example, rough sounds can uh, trigger, like like here, the um, going to the through the, um, the blackboard with with the fingers with the nails, 
it's of course very rough and very annoying uh, type of sound and uh, certain kinds of uh, features in music are also extremely unpleasant and there are brain areas which are involved in this kind of response to unpleasantness and and the uh, opposite to very pleasant uh, harmonic sounds uh, the same goes with arousal uh, uh, reactions to loudness, to very loud sounds. And even the pleasure, very intense pleasure, which could lead to chills, seems to be mapped to a few acoustic features, such as sudden peaks in loudness, brightness, and roughness. And this is a very recent study uh, by Bayer and colleagues. And uh, uh, there is an, another uh, important mechanism, which is also uh, again uh, shared, or there is a consensus in the in the community about the existence of this mechanism, and it's called contagion. And according to this uh, mechanism, uh, the emotional uh, expression of uh, uh, of uh, music is somehow reminiscent of human voice. And I would add also of animal vocalizations. So uh, here you see a study where there was um, like a mapping of the acoustic cues that are common between vocal expression and music um, expression. And so um, several of them are similar to the ones that I showed before in, the, in, the, um, uh, in this bidimensional uh, map. Uh, so, for example, uh, happiness, uh, fast tempo, and and uh, um, yeah, pitch variability, much pitch variability, and so on. And uh, the opposite for said. And here I have some examples. Like a happy vocal expression, which re resembles some of the features which are used also in music for inducing happiness and joy. <laughs> And this is from this is from animal vocalization. Of course, it's this very rough sound which you can uh, uh, composers uh, have used this kind of roughness feature also to create uh, negative uh, emotion or, or reproduce negative emotions. And this contagion mechanism um, seems to be related to. Uh, the activity of the mirror neural system or called also action observation system and which is related uh, which is actually part of the uh, motor uh, cortex in the frontal lobe and we have studies demonstrated the involvement of this uh, mirror neural system uh, from uh, musical emotions rhythmic entrainment is another mechanism Again, there is much consensus about it because we know that uh, our body includes systems that uh, are oscillating, they are synchronizing their periodic activity and they can even synchronize with uh, an external uh, stimulus. And this kind of uh, um, ability to synchronize oscillatory frequency of uh, bodily systems with the tempo of external rhythms is used or manipulated again by composers to create, um, yeah, again, to move um, the, perform the audience. And, uh, but is this enough? I don't think this is enough because if you would just entrain uh, and have repetitive uh, um, periodic stimulus, you would lose all the interest. Think about like uh, tapping like a, just, a, just a, um, a drum uh, playing it with the same beat would be totally boring. So there is definitely something else uh, that makes the music so emotional, so impactful. So, and definitely it's not just a mapping, but a simple direct mapping between features, acoustic features and music emotions. And this is because we know that emotions are like a, a if we follow especially constructivist views uh, by uh, Feldman Barrett, um, we know that there is really a mixture of ingredients that make up emotions. And uh, we know that there are limbic, limbic areas uh, that uh, regulate core effect, but then there is all, all the cognitive conceptualization parts of the brain and also attention areas and ling language, which uh, are needed to uh, fully have an emotional experience. 
And uh, in music, uh, we need a sweet balance between repetition and change, uh, as we can uh, call it. And already Schoenberg, uh, composer from, uh, from Austria, was uh, mentioning that intelligibility in music seems to be impossible without repetition, but at the same time, we can't repeat all the time, otherwise we will end up in boredom. And, uh, and there might be, um, this might be related to another mechanism for emotional induction, which is uh, the music specific and it's called uh, expectation or has been called also prediction and surprise, or it has been called anticipation. And it's exactly this balance between uh, too much uh, repetitive uh, sounds. Uh, so having a very strong uh, prediction um, in the framework of predicting coding theory, you have very strong predictive model, and then um, the errors are uh, not so often, but then this is not really uh, interesting, uh, but you need really good balance between uh, a salient, the salient error and then uh, um, the, the model that should be strong enough, but not so strong. And we can think how it works that when we have uh, like, for example, too much syncopation with the rhythm, it really, you, you lose track of it. You don't understand it, the, the rhythm anymore and it's not interesting, not nice anymore. You, do, you can't even move to the rhythm anymore. But when you have the right amount then you really feel groovy, uh, yeah. And there are also some extra musical mechanisms such as visual imagery, episodic memory and evaluative conditioning. So we, it's a very important also the context, both internal context and external. So how we feel, what is our attention, are we sleepy or not, or uh, what, we are, what are our goals from a listening experience or a musical activity, and, and then also uh, what is happening around us. And, um, and finally, um, we, well, not yet finally, but we also have aesthetic judgments, as I mentioned, as a, a sort of affective uh, outcome of a musical experience. And uh, we also know that uh, the aesthetic uh, judgments in relation to the beauty of music seems to be very focally activating uh, one part of the brain, which is uh, the orbitofrontal cortex, which also is related to uh, positive, uh, rewarding, uh, pleasurable. Uh, activities. And uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of self-awareness and here we have uh, results related to um, this per special parts of the brain called default mode network. It's a circuit which connects different brain areas that seem to be more active when uh, we are doing nothing, when we are mind wandering, daydreaming, or even ruminating. And they seem to be uh, particularly um, connected uh, when we are listening to music, especially sad music. And so there might be a relation between uh, music listening and um, concentration to our own, our self. So thinking about who we are, where we are going and, and uh, yeah, contemplating as well. And so, as I mentioned, we need also to consider the individual. Uh, so it's not as uh, simple as just uh, mapping between uh, uh, acoustic uh, physical features and an emotion, uh, but there is much more than that. So uh, the, um, all the uh, listening biography, uh, such, so the familiarity, the expertise with music definitely changes how we process sounds and um, how we feel feel, and how we are affected by sounds. And even personality and even the genes may have, may have an influence on inducing emotions from music. And uh, we have some studies which are hinting in this direction. So the relation between uh, uh, some individual differences in the biology and emotional responses. And one is actually by Matt Sachs here, I think. And, uh, and so there, there are uh, these relations between the um, white matter tracks uh, from auditory uh, cortex to, um, to uh, areas related to the uh, cheer response, which are, uh, yeah, which are predicting 
uh, how much uh, chills you might get from music. And then uh, also uh, I've done studies with uh, a PhD student, Tiziana Parto, where we actually found out that uh, uh, there, there is a specific kind of um, gene, which is uh, dopamine receptor genes, and uh, a specific mutation of it uh, that modulates how music uh, regulates the mood and how music can affect the emotional uh, responses to faces. And with this, I finished, and I, I'm afraid I've taken too much time, but I wish to thank you all for your attention and please ask questions if you like. Thank you, Elvira. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction to the overview of this very complicated and complex field. And I know it was only just touching the surface, but we're gonna shift the focus a little bit here. Uh, next, we have Shonda Danson, who is an alumna, alumnus of USC's film scoring program and the Sundance Composers Lab. She's also an accomplished film, television, and classical concert composer, and is known for her work with award-winning director Alim Hossein for the sci-fi feature After We Leave, and the hugely popular YouTube filmmaking group Wong Fu Productions on their debut feature Everything Before Us. She's also the owner of a boutique post-production studio and performs violin, keyboard, and vocals with the indie rock band Modern Time Machines. So Shonda, uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Very nice to see all of you. Very glad to be here. <laughs> Um, absolutely amazing what Dr. Bratico was saying. Um, 500,000 years of evolution <laughs> of, you know, having music be such an integral part of our psyche. Um, and I come from it um, from a purely instinctual um, kind of approach. Uh, as a film composer, you want to create an emotional journey for the audience. And there are several techniques for doing that. And what I would love to share with you all today is one particular technique that um, even Dr. Brothigo also like, <laughs> spoke about is the use of um, recognizable patterns, like essentially um, music, musical motifs and how these motifs can be repeated throughout you know, the experience, the, the, the movie presentation and how each time it's repeated, it's slightly different. It grows, it evolves until the very end where you have the motif in its full form and full glory. And it really creates an emotional journey and really keeps people's attention. And they have a, typically by the end of the film, they're in tears. Um, so um, I want to sh show with you um, the film after we leave actually. And I'll, I'll show for you, for you the, the main theme because the director and I were very specific on when we wanted the theme to play, how we wanted the theme to be treated, and how we want it to grow. And so without further ado, let me share my screen. <laughs> and we'll view some scenes from after we leave. So from the very, very beginning of the film, the very first note of music you hear is this recognizable pattern. It's, we called it the longing theme. This character uh, is lost. He's wanting to reunite with his estranged wife. Um, and so you're going to see him go through this journey, both on screen and musically, uh, on searching for his wife and the, the adventure he goes through to try to reunite with her. And in the end, he apparently reunites with her. So we'll watch this musical journey and listen to this musical journey.
So that is the theme, the longing theme. It's most recognizable in those three piano notes. Dun, dun, dun. And you're going to hear that theme evolve throughout the film. So here's the next version of it. Again, the character, we like to think of this theme as representing the character's psyche. So we can understand his emotions, what he's going through, um, which, you know, Dr. Rothko also like pointed out is an, an important function of music is uh, understanding uh, co co copathy, um, understanding emotions together. So you can understand this human on screen, even though he's a fictional character, but you can understand this human because of the music that's helping you to understand his emotions. So I find that very in interesting. <laughs> so here's the second um, version of it. So again, the theme is played as he's searching, he's, he's gone back to his old house where he and his wife used to live and he's sorely disappointed because it's abandoned. Um, so this longing theme is very sad, but yet, you know, he refuses to give up. You know, there's kind of a, an intensity to it that we were hoping to, you know, uh, portray to the audience. And the next part of our character's journey will take him to um, a character that he, he's known in the past who may possibly know where his wife is. And he's trying to strike a deal um, with this person. Um, he's pretty much a, a powerful character in the, in the film who actually, if you remember the rockets, the three rockets from the very beginning, those rockets actually take people to off world colonies. Um, so the person that he wants to go and meet with is one of those people who like sends people to off world colonies, uh, etc. But here we're going to hear a bit of the theme as he's going across this desolate parking lot because Earth has pretty much been decimated. Everybody is leaving to off world colonies because, you know, the water is bad, the air is bad, etc. So again, we're following our character's journey here. Please move along. There is no public access. Tell Carrington Jack Cheney's here to see him. Step back from the gate. Tell him Jack Cheney. Carrington, me and my sister, we know each other. Not that many people get in here. So there's that scene. Essentially, again, we have our recognizable theme. It's being used in a different manner um, to pretty much try and, and show emotionally a bit of the character's desolation, a little bit of his loneliness as he's just 
striking out, continuing his journey to try and find his, his uh, estranged wife. So which takes us to the, a, the next part of our character's journey, and it's essentially temptation. <laughs> so um, it's in, interesting how the director and I decided that we wanted to treat the musical theme, the musical pattern that we all recognize. Um, it, has, it, it has to be tempted. <laughs> so this character um, is actually kind of reuniting with a woman that he had an affair with um, previously. So it gets a little complicated. Um, it's a little icky, but seductive at the same time. So without further ado, this is the temptation, the theme going through temptation. <laughs> to sleep because anything that was touching me felt like you know one of those lead blankets and I got up and I went outside and the whole night felt that way I could tell you a million stories like that but I couldn't tell you why I left It's like there's no chance anymore that we don't have the same chance and there's nothing out there. Don't find anything out there. That's what I want. I want a chance to have something. Remember those old stories would go west. They'd just be able to have that land. Jack, stop. I want to be better than who I was. So that's our theme in Temptation. Hopefully it was effective, <laughs> our you know, in achieving our purpose there. Um, again, it was, a, you know, Dr. Brocko also like pointed this out, like the use of like uh, minor themes, um, the use of uh, low, um, low textures and like low sounds that evokes, you know, a little bit of angst, a little bit, you know, low emotions. Um, and and I, I find that amazing <laughs> how you're able to like map these things out and like actually, you know, point these things out that we're just doing by instinct. But again, I guess it's because we have 500,000 years of <laughs> evolution to <laughs> really practice these instincts and understand how to communicate these emotions with each other. So um, the second to last example um, of the use of our theme is, so the character has essentially um, gotten back in touch with one of his old crime buddies. And this crime buddy is like, I know exactly where your wife is. If you do this job for me, I'm going to show you where she is and everything will be awesome. So in this scene, our protagonist, Jack, has, he's completed the, 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 the crime, um, you know, job that he was supposed to do. And now he's been, he's been taken to a, a house in the suburbs where he thinks his wife is going to be. 
and we'll see how the theme is treated um, because this is a scene of betrayal. So <laughs> without further ado. <laughs> It's Jack, get Morgan. Why? Faith, I'm in trouble, just get him. I'm not gonna do that. Just tell him I'm in Casitas Norte. Eric has a squad house somewhere near, near there. I'm into the east of it. When you get it straight, we're here for you. Till then, don't call us again. I, I, I need you. That is the, the theme being betrayed. Our, our protagonist thought he was, he reached the promised land, but he was betrayed and kidnapped and terrible things were done to him, which we won't talk about. <laughs> but um, however, despite all of his struggles, despite everything that happened, our protagonist was able to be apparently reunited with his wife. So this is the, the final cue of the whole film. This is where we're gonna hear the full realized theme in all of its glory. Um, again, Dr. Radica was talking about how, you know, the use of volume, uh, when things get louder and more involved, it, it causes, causes uh, arousal um, and that's, something that we did in this ending cue. It's the biggest cue of the film. It completely filled the theater, kind of shook the seats, and it really affected people. And so this is the final, final hurrah. So, so without further ado, here it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, I don't want to give away the ending of the film, so I'll stop there. <laughs> but again, like I said, this is the culmination of the theme, where, where it was meant to go. And it's the reunification with his wife. Um, and the director and I really felt that using themes in this manner throughout the film, being very specific, um, even very minimal, you know, the, the score is not like a million instruments and things like that, but it is very purposeful. And it seemed to really resonate with audiences um, around the globe, really. Um, the film won Best, Best Picture at Sci-Fi London, Best Director at Sci-Fi Berlin. It was nominated for Best Score at the UK Music and Sound Awards. So I really think that it was a very universal type of, of uh, use of music that really emotionally affected people. And I hope you've enjoyed <laughs> hearing a little bit about the behind the scenes process. And thank you for tuning in. So, <laughs> Thank you so much, Shana, for sharing with us not only this beautiful piece of art, but also your kind of process and how you came up with it. So just to shift topics one last time for now, we're going to move to our last speaker, who's Dr. Anna Huang. Uh, she received her PhD in computer science at Harvard and is currently a research scientist at Google Brain working on the Magenta Project, which is an open source research project that explores how music, how machine learning can be used as a tool in the creative process. Maybe some of you remember when Google celebrated Bach's birthday by changing the Google logo into an interactive musical tool. Uh, well, that was Anna's doing. And in two days, they harmonized 55 million different melodies from users around the world. And today she'll be speaking about her research on designing generative models to make music more interactive. I'm going to shift uh, gears a bit and um, I'll talk about how music moves us uh, through the lens of machine learning. Uh, we're in no way close to really understanding uh, uh, how, how music moves us to, to, to that level that uh, amazing composer and, and, and researchers in psychology and neuroscience can. Uh, we're still kind of at the stage of um, trying to um, use machine learning to, to uh, in, a, in a generative uh, way uh, to model the different aspects uh, of music and then um, uh, uh, trying to enable uh, some new kinds of musical interaction. So I'll uh, jump right in. Uh, music uh, technology has always been a very integral part, a part of uh, music and expanding the, the range of possibilities uh, creatively. Uh, what can machine learning uh, kind of bring uh, into this dialogue? Today, I am going to focus on two uh, machine learning concepts. Uh, the first is uh, where uh, one of the goals is to be able to build generated models that are very expressive and fluent, uh, fluent in, uh, in the musical language. So sometimes we, we call these, uh, we actually call this approach kind of language modeling. Uh, and then uh, once uh, we, we have some understanding of the music, we want to build these models in a way that allows us to uh, have different ways to steer them so that users can actually interact with them and, and play with them to, to make music. I'll uh, illustrate each of these concepts uh, with a, a couple of uh, work from myself and also from uh, my uh, colleagues on the team. So first we'll talk about um, generated models. Uh, a, pr the, a prior work that I think a lot of uh, folks will th think about uh, right away um, when we're talking about artificial intelligence and, and music generation is David Cope's work. Uh, in his approach, he analyzes a lot of existing classical music to see uh, what are the harmonic structure, what are the what are the motifs, and they use and he uses existing pieces as a, a template. For example, here we see like an AA um, uh, structure. Uh, so he uses that as a template to generate a new piece, and a new piece is generated by chunking existing pieces and taking parts uh, of those. Uh, the, the chunks that have the harmonic and kind of motivic uh, uh, patterns that match uh, with the template uh, that's desired. So chunks are taken from uh, different pieces and then a new piece is being generated. Uh, so, so here you see um, it, uh, there's, there's a couple of challenges. For example, the chunks are predefined. So if you want it, uh, 
to vary what happens in a chunk, uh, this, this approach kind of falls apart. So for us, we really want to be able to model the expressivity in music on different uh, levels. So we want to be able to model the structure, how, how the story uh, it unfolds, uh, what are the notes used to support that, and also how a, a musical score would be performed by a performer with all the expressive nuances and how the ac actual sound um, uh, carries uh, all that um, uh, communication for, for us to uh, experience. So first I'll talk about Music Transformer, which is a generator model that models both the composition and the performance at once. So first I want to illustrate why it is important to not just model the score, but the actual performance. So here uh, on the top is, um, is a, a, a piano roll. On the bottom is an interpretation, visualization of an interpretation from a performer. So the different colors you see is the, the velocity, the loudness of, of how uh, the, the key is being struck and also uh, the expressive timing uh, with the, the lengths of the, the notes modified. So he here you the straight up uh, version from the score. Can we hear some? This is a, a, a performer's uh, interpretation. So immediately you hear a lot of push and pull and and, 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 a, and a lot of shaping. Uh, so in, in prior work, uh, they came up with this representation that not only captures what notes are being turned on and off, but also the velocity of the note, and also with a global clock to shift a time forward in a, in a uh, kind of a micro granularity so you can capture all that expressive timing. Music Transformer is uh, this model uh, that allows us to have a self-attention structure so we can look back at previously what we've generated. This way it uh, provides a very natural um, architecture so that you can model the self-reference that happens in music. So here you see a visualization of a sample generated by the model and the, the arcs that you see is the self-attention from the model itself. So it's looking back at these different points where the motifs are re repeating and uh, these are a generative structure of when the model is making these creative decisions, what in the past is it relying on to inform uh, it, its way of going forward. Here I'll show you a visualization of, of that process unfolding. So that was a model trying to capture both uh, the, the, the structure and, and uh, the, the nuances of the performance. Uh, and uh, the next project, uh, Wave to MIDI to Wave, is trying to really connect to the sound. Uh, there's a, a, a lot more uh, in, in, in recordings, in the music, we, we, we have the performer's interpretation. And if we can transcribe uh, that interpretation from the audio into a symbolic uh, MIDI form, uh, then we can use, for example, Music Transformer to model that expressiveness and then uh, have another model to synthesize the MIDI into sound uh, to capture all the expressiveness in the, in the instrument also. So uh, this is the overall process. And so uh, next I'll play you a sample uh, gener uh, generated uh, through uh, this process.
uh, here you hear the the piano and and then this kind of the, the all the levels of structure being being captured uh piano is 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 a, it's in some ways a percussion per, percussion kind of instrument so later on we'll see an instrument uh, 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 a model that's able to get uh, more of the expressive kind of a, a portamento and, and continuous uh, kind of gestures uh, at uh, later on in, in the talk uh, so that was um, that's some examples of showing how we can uh, use machine learning to, uh, in, in a generative fashion, uh, after modeling uh, some of the structure in music. And here I'm going to uh, go into an example where uh, we wanted to think about the user interaction as uh, kind of the entry point. So the problem I wanted to uh, solve was uh, if if I'm in the middle of composing and, and this is how my score looks like. Uh, can I get a model to help me glue it together and, and so that I can more quickly prototype and, and try out different ideas. Uh, this turned out to be quite hard uh, because a, a lot of the models that we use kind of assume that music happens from uh, kind of uh, from left to right chronologically. And, and that means uh, it's modeling music in a way where it's modeling what are the ways to start and then conditioning on what uh, the ways to start, what, what is the next note, what is uh, the following notes. Uh, so a particular ordering is being picked. Uh, definitely we can pick a backwards ordering too. It's like if we wanted to end the piece this way, what are the different ways to lead up to it? Uh, but in music we have uh, multiple instruments playing at the same time. Uh, so it's more like a grid. So how do you choose an ordering through this grid? Uh, we can go through all the, uh, the melodies or we can go through the chords. But this really forces us to choose like what is the primary axis of our analysis and in music theory we, 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 we know there's a lot of tension there and it really depends on the context. So we, we uh, asked ourselves like, is there a way that we don't have to choose an ordering because we want to support all these different kinds of tasks. We want to be able to do infilling, we want to be able to harmonize, we want to be able to just like brainstorm from scratch. So what if we just like masked out different parts of the music in, in these different ways and, and then ask the model to reconstruct the music? Would this, uh, would this help us? And it, uh, and it turns out mathematically, it, it actually works out. Uh, this is a toy example where uh, say we see the middle note and we want the model to reconstruct what comes before and what comes after. So when we're training the model this way, actually what it's learning is conditioned on the second note, or what are some possible first notes? And this corresponds to uh, thinking about filling in the music in a particular order. Here it's two and then one and then three. Uh, another uh, component that you can learn uh, in this setting is given the second note, what is the third note? And that actually corresponds to another uh, term in, another, in a different ordering, two, three, one. So here you can see if you do, uh, if you go, go over all the permutations and different ways to mask out uh, the music, then you actually have all the components necessary uh, to generate in any order. Uh, so a musician friend of ours was uh, very excited about um, this model and, and, and he wanted to put it to test. Uh, so he said, can I compose a melody for your model uh, uh, to harmonize? So after uh, weeks of uh, anticipation, this was uh, what he sent me. A joke <laughs> and then I realized okay this is a trick question the, the ending was altered and it, it, in particular it, with traditional models that kind of generate from left to right uh, when then they encounter this uh, modified ending it's actually too late to to be able to change it but because uh, our model uh, actually generates through multiple iterations of rewriting so here you see the melody is given and then uh, initially it's unsure it's very colorful it's unsure where it wants to fill in so it kind of sketches and then later on it goes in and refines uh, the, the notes locally. And this is the result from the model. So uh, this is uh, the same model that you um, 
might have played with uh, with the uh, on the doodle, and it's the same interaction. You input a, a melody, and the model goes through this rewriting process to to help you harmonize it. Um, and here is a short video showing that experience. All right, let's start with an E. E do E. The user entering uh, a melody that he knew. He, he knew. E, to D, C, and B. This sounds great. Now let's click the harmonize button. It doesn't sound too bad, right? It sounds pretty awesome. But now, how does it sound if we play these four voices on a guitar? On four guitars, let's find out. So in two days, a lot of people played with it. And um, in the next example, we want to show another way of interacting um, with uh, these generator models. In particular, uh, this is an approach called uh, uh, latent spaces, where uh, you can encode uh, different any, any objects. It could be a sketch. It could be a music fragment. And then it uh, learns this uh, lower dimensional space that tries to put objects that are similar together. And it tries to learn the salient, salient features that allows it to reconstruct the object later. So for example, in, for sketches, it's easier to uh, see. You can see, um, uh, for example, on the right, uh, the different shapes of faces being interpolated. On the bottom, you can see a little uh, cat being interpolated to a pig as the different features uh, change and, and being, are being added. Um, so how does this sound for music? If we were to interpolate between two melodies, uh, this is how it might sound. Uh, this clip is quite, uh, is about a minute and 20 seconds, so you're in for a little bit of a journey and it's uh, kind of walking the latent space and interpolating from one end to the other. This is the destination we want to get to. So here we go. One way uh, you could blend the different musical features between uh, two motifs and, and create variation. So the last example I'll show uh, is uh, coming back to the sound. Um, and, tr and previously to generate sound, it was a very expensive process. You need a lot of training data and uh, the models generated sample by sample. So if, if, a, if, if the audio was recorded at 16 Hertz, um, if it's modeled at, at that frequency, uh, then it would need that many steps to generate a second of audio. Uh, but uh, uh, Jesse and, and colleagues, uh, they 
wanted to take this new approach where um, it's in, the model uh, is actually informed by uh, digital signal uh, processing units because we know how uh, we have a lot, a lot of knowledge of how sound is synthesized. Uh, why don't we take advantage of that? For example, there's additive synthesis, there's a filtered noise synth uh, to capture the, the more uh, kind of attack uh, onset parts of uh, a sound uh, and also reverb that uh, kind of brings everything together. Uh, in particular, they uh, formulated the input, the conditioning signal as uh, the audio is coming in and we're going to extract the pitch, the fundamental pitch and also the loudness. And then we're going to model how each instrument uh, can be rendered, for example, how violin uh, should sound uh, given these features. And this uh, allows for a very um, uh, creative interaction because you can put in any sound and extract, be able to extract these two features and then turn it into any instrument. So uh, this example I'll show you is uh, Hanoi, who is the second author on this paper. He's going to sing a melody and, and, and all the expressive nuances of, of his singing, uh, the, the personal aspects of it will be tone transferred uh, to be played on the violin. So let's try again. Um, where over the rainbow way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. Hanoi is a friend, so when I listen to the violin, I really feel that it's him speaking through the instrument, and uh, that's pretty amazing. And, and here, uh, this is the last uh, video uh, audio example of show, uh, is uh, Andrew Huang, a, a musician. Uh, he, he just took this model uh, and do what mus musicians do best. experiment i want to try and use the system completely wrong like feed it some audio material that it's not really meant to digest so he's feeding the model this beat All right, so we got a fun modular patch. I ran it through all the models and my favorite results were with the tenor saxophone. <laughs> Now what if we layered that on top of the original sound? So today I uh, covered two uh, concepts in machine learning, uh, thinking about generated models and, and how we can interact uh, with them. And I think these are uh, could be very expressive uh, building blocks uh, for us to understand the different emotional aspects uh, in music. Uh, for example, thinking about how uh, these, these models provide in a generative context, how attention and expectation might be modeled, um, how the different levels of structure might relate and interact with each other. And also in terms of, uh, these uh, latent spaces and latent dimensions. Currently, a lot of them are learned in an unsupervised way. Uh, in the future, we can imagine learning these features that really align with the human representation that we care about so that we can interact with these models in a more semantic and uh, in a, uh, intuitive way. Thank you. Uh, you can, for any of the projects that I've mentioned, we have a blog post with all the examples that you saw today in the talk. Uh, so uh, we welcome you to check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was really incredible examples and amazing work you're doing there. Uh, so we're running a bit over time, um, but anyone is free to stay on for, uh, for the next part of the session. 
It was originally going to be kind of a couple of questions that I, uh, that I was going to ask all of, all of the speakers, but I think I will sort of try to tie mine together into uh, some questions that have been going on in the chat. If you have other questions or if you like some of the questions there, you can upvote them now. Um, one of the questions that was uh, partially answered, uh, but I, I think is an interesting point. In Shonda, in your presentation, you illustrated how one musical theme, like a similar acoustic features or at least a, a similar motif, can acquire a different emotional meaning depending on the context or the changes in intensity. And this definitely can complicate at least what I do and probably what Dr. Bradico do, does. And I'm curious how much it affects how much um, Dr. Huang does in the sense that we're, we're assuming that this musical piece is gonna convey one emotion based on the acoustical features or how a person hears it, but context varies so much and can change constantly. Totally. Is there in any even essence to, what, to a piece of music being able to convey one emotion at one given time? Um, well, I did you know, try, try to answer a little bit, but I think really music married with other media is so, it, it's, it's a different bear because film music really is, you know, up for, you know, music by itself can actually be up for interpretation. You know, you, if, you're, if you're just listening to the soundtrack of After Relief by itself, if you hadn't seen the pictures, you know, maybe each time the motif comes, maybe it will put you in a little bit of a mood or, or a certain mood and not vary as much as when it's with the screen, you know, like the on-screen images, it's, 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 syn it's synergy. It becomes just a completely different life form, you know? And so, you know, when film composers are working in mediums such as that, we, we, we really try to kind of convey a certain point of view because the picture is trying to convey a certain point of view. Um, so I don't know if that's, more helpful or <laughs> gives more context. But I mean, you know, I don't come from this from a very technical, you know, standpoint. It's, it's all very instinctual and collaborative. You know, it's just a group of humans that are telling a story, both through picture and through organized sound. So really what comes out comes out. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I, I would I would be interested in. Uh, should we talking. should we go yeah uh, around yeah yeah if, feel free Dr. Yeah. Uh, yeah they they opened the door so that somebody could come here but anyway um, yeah no I think that that uh, the answer is uh, yes and no because I mean from what we know about how uh, music can induce emotions I think that much of it is predictable because we know uh, that some features are like, really uh, clearly re related to certain emotional responses. And we also, I think, know uh, quite much about, uh, or not enough, but there is some research about combination between sounds and, and uh, uh, pictures and how they can uh, support each other and how they can uh, you know, amplify the emotional responses. So, and we know that music has this, or the, one of these mechanisms, I didn't have time to, to describe it properly, but uh, this visual imagery is another way to, to convey uh, emotions through music. So you can actually try to let people imagine um, uh, through sounds, like, like for example, there was in the very wonderful, uh, I really enjoyed a lot your uh, uh, movie soundtrack, by the way. And there was one which was, um, in, at one point there was the heartbeat. So uh, of course you, you were really using that uh, for uh, creating or letting uh, the audience imaging this state of uh, almost tachycardia or this state of very strong uh, um anxiety and then you built on it to the other sounds and so on so i mean it was just an example of how you can represent uh, but uh, it's it's used a lot so i think that that uh, on one hand yeah there is this possibility to to predict and we know that certain sounds induce certain kinds of emotions but i think that it's just a little part of the emotional experience and it's what uh, what um 
uh, could be called core affect you know, according to constructionist models or or uh, just the perception and induction of these basic emotions. But then on the top of it, there is the whole aesthetic thing. So like how we decide that this is actually nice music. So apart from the, from the fact that it expresses some emotions, but, but we still the evaluative, evaluative uh, judgment is something completely else and the, and the pleasure is something completely else. I hope uh, it was very long, but, but it, it is a quite complex experience. So there might be actually several kinds of emotions uh, stratifying with each other. And the certain kinds of emotions are predictable and they are kind of uh, universal and they can be, so they are this kind of basic um, brainstem refresher, all these basic uh, mechanisms and all the others are variable. So, yeah. I didn't catch the question completely. Was it about how, how context affects uh, our perception of the emotion and the music? Okay, yeah, context, uh, both our perception and then our feeling, and then how does that complicate your work? In a sense that mm -hmm. you have to now consider the various ways and times and modalities in which people might be experiencing the music. That, that's a really good question. Uh, initially, I was I was uh, kind of thinking just thinking about musical context. Uh, for example, uh, in a lot of our models, like we try to uh, not just look at the local context of what's happening, but what has been unfolding in history and in, in the listener's memory, and being able to see what kinds if if you're self referencing these parts of the memory and and how what that would that affect. Um, how you're understanding if there is a relationship that's building or maybe you're missing that link of relationship. And I think in our generated models, we can do some interesting experiments with, uh, we have these self-attention uh, mechanisms. We can uh, encourage some of them, uh, maybe, uh, maybe disconnect some of them and uh, see how that actually affects the, the music and, and, um, and maybe how, what might be, uh, maybe somebody has a at, at a certain moment has a, a shorter attention span or maybe a longer attention span in terms of the the listening uh, modality that, that they're in and uh, may, maybe different kinds of music with uh, these uh, self references of different lengths could um, could kind of be generated to to reflect that. I guess in general there there could be a feedback loop between um, the the user and, and and the generated models to be able to kind of search in different spaces and and see what the responses are uh, and maybe uh, kind of help us understanding our experience more. Yeah, I like the the framework that the that sort of Dr. Bradico was mentioning that there are underlying things that are going to be more universal and then there's these higher level concepts that are added onto it that change the experience and Shonda, you were able to kind of manipulate all of those with. Uh, the, the addition of the film. And often, Dr. Bradica and I, in our work, we often kind of strip it down to its more essential elements, which means that we're able to control certain things, but then we're also not able to look at certain aspects of the experience. And that's where we just don't know. Uh, and I have a question, another question here um, that I will try to relate to the other speakers as well. Uh, the question is about the Lovelace test, which requires that any computational procedure that results in a genuinely creative act must, by definition, be inexplicably inexplicable by the human programmer. Uh, and so, do you see instances in which your programs are able to generate surprising or unpredictable results? And uh, the follow-up question is: Yeah, so is there is is kind of our underlying cultural biases of music and understanding that the programmers have being incorporated into the music models. If that second part makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I'll, I, I'll, try to, I'll try to navigate. Um, so uh, one, one main aspect is uh, with the machine learning approach, we're kind of um, programming on a meta level. So um, we're using Kind of like choices of the data, the choices of the architectures, uh, for example, like what kinds of kind of, uh, higher level structure do we favor to, um, and so those are the levels of decision making we're uh, we're doing. Uh, so we're not a kind of encoding um, a lot of the musical knowledge uh, yet. I think a hybrid approach could could really help. Um, so a lot of times, um, it, the result can be it can be quite surprising. Uh, for example, like one. Um, 
one characteristics I hear in a lot of the, the samples that, that our models generate is that it's um, able to kind of uh, string together a lot of different interesting thoughts and make these transitions between thoughts in a very musical way. So it feels like locally it's very consistent and it's this very interesting twist and turn that you go through. Um, but overall, the, the structure is, is really not um, as uh, of a um, uh, kind of choreographed uh, experience as uh, you would hope for. Just open this up a little bit more. Shanda, I'm interested if music could if you could see these tools as a way to sort of get out of like a potentially creative box, let's say you're not feeling particularly inspired by something, could you imagine a world in which you could use something like this to uh, find some new creative ideas? I think so. I'm, I'm not one of those composers who's afraid of technology. You know, there's always something that's always going to inspire you. Um, and so like, even from like the really cool examples that Dr. Wong like, you know, showed, it's like, yeah, I could, I could like take something like that and riff on it, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, I could see, you know, sometime in the future when, you know, like the AI grows and, 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 and things like that, that yeah, it could be a tool for composers just to like, hey, let's just create something different, you know? Um, because machines do, think differently from humans you know it's not you know we again 500,000 years of evolution <laughs> has us doing things a certain way and feeling a certain way and I think it's exciting to have an injection of just something different you know what I mean it doesn't the whole point of if it's good or not subjective you know it's just hey let's try something different and I, I think the prospect of that is very exciting so yeah I think It'd be awesome to get to work together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One other comment in the chat was um, directed at Anna, but I think it brings up an interesting question, which is what would happen if, the, if your models were fed uh, John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds? <laughs> but I think this, well, you can answer that directly, but I think the more general question that I think is interesting and related to everyone is, how do you actually go about trying to define music? For, for Dr. Bradico, when, it, when you're gonna pick stimuli for your study, what is considered music? Uh, for Dr. Huang, what, when your models come out with something, what is considered music and what is not? And for Shanda, what, when the director needs music, when do you know it's music and when it's not? That might be a very uh, silly question, but it's one that I'm often asked and I think it's kind of raised in this question. Who starts? <laughs> Why don't you start? Okay. Yeah, uh, this really actually important point. But in in the my um, conceptions or my yeah my research, I've been trying to consume music uh, not just as sound um, and not only sound, of course, because music written music is also music, of course, and uh, and. Uh, um, yeah, and, and I think that, that um, yeah, in the neuroscience literature, the dominant definition has been organized sound or something like that. But in fact, it's much more than that. And it has all the visual uh, and uh, bodily experience, somatosensory, and, yeah, and so on and so forth. And uh, so it's actually multisensorial experience, which involves... Um, uh, of course, it involves some periodicity uh, in the in sounds, and uh, but it's very hard to to describe. Of course, we can uh, look at the research that has been done uh, by, by, for example, Savage and colleagues about what are the universal features uh, in all the um, yeah human uh, uh, yeah uh, examples of music production. But of course, then we have we have to or they selected still some songs from uh, from different places in the world but but uh, for example music um, was uh, sharing the use of voice and use of words so in in our uh, research tradition uh, sometimes are being criticized for actually once publicly i was criticized at the conference because i studied uh, uh, i used the songs in my research 
and um, somebody uh, quite authoritative in the field said that this is not music, it's music with words. <laughs> and I was really shocked because actually this is the, the, the pop, I mean, the songs are the most common representation of uh, music uh, culture everywhere, almost everywhere. So anyway, but, but this is, I think that uh, we should really think carefully what is really music and what should encompass. And I think it should encompass much more than sound. And perhaps sound is, of course, important uh, component of it, but it's not the only one. And I think that in another, actually, I have questions for, for, for especially Anna, because I think that another important component is intention. And this comes a lot from, from maybe philosophy, uh, uh, literature, but, but it's very interesting to think about uh, whether we, we need the intention at all when we have AI music. Or although I think that the intention to think that this is music is already making it music. I don't know if you follow what I'm saying, but, but uh, yeah, you can make music just by repeating words in a certain way, like creating a chant or, or thinking that some weird sounds are music. Like if you think about modern, some modern electronic compositions. So I mean, intentions could be not just from the composer, but it could be from the audience. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I, I, res I resonate with that a lot. Um, I think it's a, a very distributed uh, uh, kind of uh, experience. Uh, at the same time, I, I really uh, want to build these models as tools uh, for, for composers. Um, I, I also studied uh, music composition. I happen to be also at USC. Um, so it's, it's great to see alumni, but I, I didn't really like the music I was writing uh, when I was graduating. Um, so I, I went for more uh, computer science, uh, but a dream of mine is, is still, is still uh, to, to get back into composing and, and, and to have uh, these new tools as kind of new lenses um, to interact with. So I feel like in terms of what is music, I, I really want to um, define it to, to, to work with musicians because mu musicians and composers are shaping the, the future of music and uh, to be able to work more closely with musicians and, and hear about what you care uh, and, and creatively and aesthetically and, and personally is I think would help uh, our research a lot. Yeah, and, you know, piggybacking on, on that, you know, from, from a composer standpoint, technically anything is music. You know, we, if it's, if it's a sound wave, if, if it's a wave that moves air <laughs> and we can somehow control it, that's what we do. <laughs> so, you know, um, Dr. Bradico did have a, a specific example of like, you know, there was a, a rave with um, deaf individuals and like music can still be felt through vibration because it's, it's waves through the air. So you know, if there's any sort of like mechanism that captures that and, and again, coming to intention, we can intentionally capture that and share it, then it's music, you know? So John Cage's, you know, four minutes and 33 seconds, totally. He intentionally captured silence, the sound of the world around us. And that's music, so. I have to write it down what you said. <laughs> you put it beautifully. <laughs> I, I guess it's a good thing it's recorded. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I with I think that's probably a best time as ever to end this portion of the discussion. So I want to thank the three of you for being here, for speaking on your research and your work, and and for being part of this uh, really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you still listening, I do hope that you will tune in again um, at, for our next uh, seminar and um, please visit our website and sign up for announcements. Thank you all very much for attending and thank you so much to our speakers for a really wonderful session today. Thank you. Bye.